Well, greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. We're glad that you can join us once again. Amen. 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 And participate. You can make comments, on, uh, questions on the study at uh, Facebook, mm -hmm. facebook.com slash In Search of Christianity. So we're just glad you can be here. This is our uh, ninth part of this or ninth program in this series and we're continuing on talking about the transition of Christianity the change in Christianity mm -hmm. and we're doing a little historical study looking at Acts chapter 6 to see a transition a change in the way the church operated but before we do that I'm going to ask brother Mark to if he'll ask God's blessing on our time Hallelujah. together thank you Lord. oh Lord we thank you that we have the opportunity to study your word yes. but we also thank you for the cross and Amen. the power of your love to go there. Amen. And just may we learn to know what that is. Amen. 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 All right, we, uh, in, in our last program, I was talking about in Acts chapter 6 how progressively we see a difference. You know, there's the church, the portrayal of the church in Acts chapter 2, and then we looked at Acts chapter 4 where there's a subtle difference, so a little bit different. And then we moved on to Acts chapter 6, and we were talking about growth in a church. Because we wouldn't be searching for Christianity if something hadn't changed. And I said this is about a church in transition. But the interesting thing is, and I, I think nobody can deny the fact, that if we take uh, Jesus and the Sermon on the Mount as what Christianity should look like, it's undeniable that the church has not, I mean, has changed yes. over the millennia, centuries, millennia. The problem is we're supposed to look like Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And I think I read somewhere, like in Hebrews 13, 8, <laughs> that he is the same yesterday, today, and yes, forever. And it says of God the Father, he is not a man that he should change. So the, when I talk about radical Christianity, Radical comes from the same the, the word that's used for radish. It's a root. Mm -hmm. So being a radical Christian is getting back to the root of our faith, the root of our Christianity, and that is to look like Jesus Christ. And by the way, I just want to say that, that we, we talked in the beginning of this about the power of words. That word radical has been shanghaied mm. by the devil yes. to mean something evil. evil. Because people, when they hear a word radical, they think of right. something evil. But I want to tell you that I make no bones about being a radical Christian, right. seeking to get back, <clears throat> get back to the roots of our faith, as I said. Amen. So we talked in our last program about how a church grows, or how a congregation grows. Mm. All right? um, the, <clears throat> the first two reasons that congregations grow, not the church, right? All right. but congregations grow, is one was the good, which is feeding people's spirit, exalting Jesus Christ, lifting him up that men may be drawn to him. And the second reason, which is a bad reason, mm -hmm. was that too many, too many quote-unquote churches are feeding the flesh. Yes. And we showed examples that, <coughs> excuse me, of how that happens and, and why it happens and scripturally how true that fact is. So we've talked about the good and the bad, now we're going to talk about the ugly. Mm -hmm. Because there is indeed a third reason for church growth. And this is what you have to understand in order to understand why we need to be looking for the real thing. You see, without understanding the ugly part of growth, you can't understand how Christianity has changed so much, become so divided, and look quite unlike Jesus Christ. Because the enemy, the third reason is because the enemy plants Heirs, yes. the spirit of destruction in the church. Mm -hmm. This is the, the parable that Jesus told, right? Of the wheat and the tares, mm -hmm. right? Now, we started out reading the first verse. We're still in the first verse of Acts chapter 6, and it talked about a problem arose in Jerusalem. Okay? Well, before this problem arose in Jerusalem, Jesus had told 
that parable of the wheat and the tares, showing a tactic of our enemy, the devil, to place imitators among the true believers. And his purpose is always, it's constant, is to steal, to kill, and destroy. That's what Jesus said, John 10.10. 10. And we've been well warned about that. I mean, there's so many warnings of it, but I just wanted to give you a couple from, from the Word, so there's no, no doubt about this, right? Jesus said in Matthew 7, 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Mm. The wolves in sheep's clothing, right? We were warned by Peter when he wrote, But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. 2 Peter 2, 1. Paul, again, I mean, just an, another example. He said to the Galatians, but it was because of the false brethren secretly brought in who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ, in, order, in Christ Jesus, in order to bring us into bondage. Right? Galatians 2, 4. And then in Acts, as he's going back to Jerusalem and he's passing by Ephesus, mm -hmm. and he, he's speaking to the elders of the church in Ephesus, he says to, to them, Be on your guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. By the Apostle John, in his first letter, he said, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. 1 John 4.1 Let me tell you something. We ended the last program talking about revival, right? Satan, who Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians 11, comes as an angel of light, he wants to fill the pulpits and the pews of the churches, and believe me, that's not revival. No. Okay? Yeah. All right, so now... So we've had plenty of warning. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. It, it troubles me to see, because discernment is a, a fruit, a gift of the Holy Spirit, yes. right? And I see so many quote-unquote Bible-believing Christians who are duped mm. by false teaching by false teachers and being led astray. Now that's a, that's simply a fact. I mean, you can say that's judgmental. No, it's not judgmental, it's discerning. Yes. And we are indeed to judge those inside the church, to test the spirits. What does it say? There's a verse that says the simplicity of the gospel? Yeah, that's uh, Paul again right into the Corinthians. He said he was concerned lest the serpent who deceived Eve come along again and remove the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. Mm -hmm. and, and he has indeed. Uh, you know, our, our faith is actually a very simple faith. It's just believing, accepting that free gift of God through the work of Jesus Christ, the atoning work of Jesus Christ, and accepting the work that he's done. And then it's the Holy Spirit who's been put into us. We are the temple of the living God who works in and through us to accomplish his purpose. What we need to do is just submit to that. Yes, willing vessels. Uh, again, we've talked about that in previous programs in there, right? It's easy enough for a three-year-old to understand, but the wisest man not to explain it. Uh, well, that's why God still makes foolish, foolish the wisdom of the world. Wise. Yes, yeah. the wise. Okay. <clears throat> so here, we're looking at this whole situation in Acts chapter 6 to look at what took place to change the character and the nature of the early church, right? And just let me read that first verse again one time, right? Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews, because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. Well, right off the bat, you know, we're instructed through the Word of God by the Apostle Paul and he says, in writing to the Philippians, he said, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world. Philippians 2, 14 and 15. We're not supposed to be a grumbling crowd. We're supposed to be giving thanks. This, you know, it says that in, in, in 
1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it says that we are to be given thanks in all things, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. So, I'm going to say grumbling and complaining misses the mark. It's a sin. Absolutely. Okay, it's a sin. However, this complaining was not the root of the problem that took place in Acts chapter 6. And more importantly, a need for food was not the problem. For the Lord was indeed supplying all of her, his, their needs as the word promises. Mm -hmm. his, his word, can't, he watches over his word to perform it. He can't lie. All right? So this sinful grumbling was the visible and vocal symptom of division. All of a sudden, before in Acts chapter 2, they were of one mind, one heart. Mm -hmm. Right? Acts chapter 4, they're of one mind, one heart. And all of a sudden, Acts chapter 6, and no, it's this group of, of believers and that group of believers, and there's division among them. That was the problem. You mentioned some other time where the more they were afflicted, the more they multiplied. Yes, it says in Deuteronomy. Then, then it says someplace else, the more they multiply, the more they sinned. Yes, in Hosea. And it says increase and sin right in the same verse. Absolutely. Boom. Because the word is true, and that's why we have this warning. You know, we, we have the word of God to... It says whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, all right? Mm -hmm. We should be learning from these things, okay? And that's why we're doing this teaching, is that we learn in these perilous last days when there is such an assault on the Word of God, all right? Yes. So let me ask you a question. What do you, what do you think? Was the division between the native Hebrews and the, the, the uh, Hellenistic Jews you think that was because the native Hebrews felt superior? I'm going, to, I'm going to answer that question and say yes. Because pride always provides a foundation for division. Mm. And was this an attitude that led them to believe that they deserved an abundance? For indeed, they had to have more food than they needed. As I mentioned above, right, there was obviously enough food to feed everyone. For as the scripture indicates, the problem was in the distribution of the food. Not a lack of food, yeah. but the way it was being distributed. Mm -hmm. That means a group of people wanted to keep well, some food that they didn't need. Ta -da. <laughs> pride and greed. Well, that's what, that's what happens. is because you, you get a sense that pride you know. leads to a, a sense. And this of is entitlement. A word, and that's a word you hear so much. That's the word I was going to say, entitlement. I deserve more because I'm better than you, all right? Okay, so the apostles saw the solution to this complaint as to have the people who would now oversee the serving of the food, they'd get people to, to become waiters, basically, servants, right? Ensuring that all received what they needed. It wasn't about obtaining more food. They didn't ask, okay, let's get some people to go out and get us more food, right? It was about, let's get some, let's appoint seven men to serve, yes. distribute the food, so it's distributed properly. But the underlying problem was still there, and well, it, didn't, it wasn't addressed. Well, that's, that's what we're going to talk about, because that's exactly, this is where a major, this is a major shift in the early church, okay? Let's apply a little logic. If there was enough food for everybody, and some lacked, then it becomes obvious that some must have had more than they needed. But the, the people that they're pointing out is the widows are the ones that were being overlooked. But of, of that group. Yes, of okay, the uh, of, of group, right. So this is a good place for me to share my theology. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, as I mentioned, the Word promises that the Father will supply all of our needs through His riches and glory in Christ Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. Philippians 4.19. Yep. The thing is that when I have a need... God, in His wonderful and perfect plan, will most often, more often than not, give the very thing that I need to a brother or sister over there. Mm -hmm. Now, since that person, now I'm going to explain why, right? Since that person did not have a need for that thing, they now have an abundance. Yes. Uh, that's what the word abundance means, is having more than you need, right? Now consider what Paul wrote to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 8.14. Listen to this. At this present time, 
your abundance being a supply for their need, so that their abundance also may become a supply for your need, that there may be equality. God gives some abundance to meet others' needs. That's what it says. That's how he works. Okay? Listen to what John said in his, in his first letter, John 3, 1 John 3, 16 and 17. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Okay? And we talk, I know I talked about this last week. We're, we're supposed to see what's going on in the lives of our brothers and sisters. Be, why? Because that's what you do with people you love. Because you look the at church them, right? started. Their that's family. how it started. Right. Yeah, that, but that's okay. how it started. Yeah. They saw the need in each other's lives. So now, again, you know, I, I, I really ask that you pray about this and seek God about the truth of what I'm saying. Because I know that this is an uncommon teaching about Acts chapter 6. But you see, you know it says in Ecclesiastes 1.9, there's nothing new under the sun, mm -mm. right? That's right. So since that's true, mm -hmm. it's very likely that there was a prosperity theology that had taken hold even then, mm -hmm. one which proclaimed that having more than you needed was a sign of God's favor and blessing, and it was all for you. Mm -hmm. That's what most prosperity preaching is today, my friend. My point is that the people who should have dealt with the problem were the people who were having the problem. Mm. The Hellenistic and the native Jews. Absolutely, yeah. Okay? When, when they did not deal with the problem, the task of solving the problem fell to those entrusted with the word, the apostles. Mm -hmm. Now, this was a spiritual problem, and it required a spiritual That's solution. Mm -hmm. The problem was the vision. The thing is, they came up with a solution to a symptom, not a solution to the problem. Right. It's like a Band-Aid. Absolutely, all right? Now, I, I'm gonna say this, and I, I said this last week, let me please say this again. I, I would fear for my salvation where I would just sit here in judgment of faithful men of God, like Peter and Andrew and James and John. I'm not doing that. But unfortunately, the apostles, being human like us all, lacking in the perfection that is yet to come, failed to bring a word spoken in due season. Right. That's what it says in Proverbs 15, right? Mm -hmm. And they chose another course. And in doing so, they began to tolerate and accommodate Definitely. sin in the early church. If division is sin, and if you don't know that division is sin, you better go seek God. Or at least go back and listen to some of the earlier shows on here. Because Jesus prayed that there would be no division among us. The word commands that there be no division among us. The problem was the sin of, of this division that I'm sure came in through pride. Pride is a gateway to all sin. All right? mm -hmm. And yet, they're only dealing with the symptom. They're not dealing with the problem. And that's what they were supposed to be doing. So it says... So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, It's not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Now, the Greek word that's translated desirable, in, in my, I'm using the New American Standard, by the way, and I think it's, uh, it's reason in the King James. The word is arrestos. It's always translated otherwise in the New Testament as pleasing. All right? It appears in John 8, Acts 12, 1 John. So it wasn't pleasing to the apostles, right, that they would neglect the word to serve tables. But interestingly, it was at another meal, which was probably not terribly long before this, that the King of Glory, the Lord of Lords, served food to his disciples. Mm -hmm. And then, it says in John 13, got up from supper, laid aside his garments, and taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel with which he was girded. Jesus performed the task of a servant. And then, going on in John 13, it says, So when he had washed their feet and, 
taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, wash your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet, for I gave you an example that you should also do as I did to you. And if that example was not enough to remind the apostles that their ministry was to serve, then at least Peter, who had been the most impacted by that very deed, yes. should have remembered what his ministry was as described by Jesus. Yes. So when he had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said, Tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said this to him a third time. Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Hmm. Want to know what his ministry was? <laughs> okay. You see, it, it wouldn't be good to leave or neglect the word to serve tables. Absolutely. Amen. Yet, Jesus was able to serve his disciples without neglecting the word. That's right. If you, my brother or sister, are a plumber, you had better not neglect the word of God in doing your plumbing. Mm -hmm. If you're a banker, you had better not neglect or leave the word to do that. You see, we are all called, this is what we talked about last week, we are all, or the week before, we are all called to ministry. And you want to know something? We use expressions that are so invalid in the church. Mm -hmm. We are all called to full-time ministry. Yes. It's not about getting a salary. Not a part-time. It's not part-time. Mm -hmm. Being an, a faithful ambassador for Christ. Being that one who brings the knowledge of the brain. That's what you're supposed to do all the time. Full-time. You're not supposed to turn it on and off when you walk into a building that's called a church. Yeah. Incorrectly. Okay. So in love, then, I, I'm going to say this. The apostles were neglecting the word of God when they failed to bring the word of correction to the flock that was sinfully divided. Right. If I, let me just get a little bit ahead of myself here. I want to point out that the sin that is not dealt with, and that's dealing with it is called repentance, is carried as part of your life. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay? If you don't repent of your sin... You carry that baggage you. around in your, all right? So I just want to go and jump ahead and, in time. And continue to do it. Until the time you repent. repent. So I just want to jump ahead in time mm -hmm. and change places here and go to another meal, all right? We talked about the first meal and the second meal, all right? This is in Antioch. When Cephas, Peter, came to Antioch, this is Paul writing. He said, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. Galatians 2, 11 and 12. You get this picture? Peter, because he knows better, he's in, he's in a Gentile area, right? He's, he's in Antioch, and he's eating with the brethren. Jew and Gentile alike, because in Christ Jesus there is neither Jew nor Gentile, right? Mm -hmm. But when some brothers come from, from Jerusalem, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he shuffles away and gets away from the Gentiles. He doesn't want to be seen. He doesn't want to be seen with Gentiles. <coughs> so he, he withdraws from fellowship with the Gentiles. That's called division. division. Yes. So what happened? Paul, it says, confront him, opposed him to his face in front of everybody. Rebuked him. Rebuked him. And hallelujah, Paul, Pete, Paul Peter. repented. Peter. Peter repented. Yes. <laughs> okay. I get excited with this stuff. All right. Because if you don't repent of your sin, you're going to carry it around as baggage until somebody has to, you know, I want to tell you that the Spirit is gentle. 
You know, there's something wrong in your life. The Spirit will gently yeah, tap sure. you on the soul, yeah. shoulder. Yeah. He'll whisper to you through His Word. And we should receive that Word yes. and change. That's the change that we need. And the other interesting thing about all of this is the person that they put in charge of distributing the oh, food. Oh, yeah, but you're going way ahead of me now, yeah. Okay, do you, do you want to do this? Yeah, well, we're not even going to get to that today. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll get to it, right? Um, what I was saying is that... Um, the nudging of the Holy Spirit. But if you don't respond to that nudging of the Holy Spirit, God's going to send somebody and get in your face. That's right. And you ought to thank God for that, that He won't let you go. Because that sin, no matter how large or small, according to our... is, is separating us from God. Yes. Sin separates you from God. Whether it's a foot or a mile, but sin separates you from God, right? So, so Peter repented. So Peter did repent. Yes. But thank God for the boldness of a man like Paul who brought a word. Confronted with it. Brought the word. Yeah. Because it says in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed and profitable for correction, mm -hmm. for reproof, for training in righteousness. For so because he didn't take care of the situation back then, he carried it, he carried with, it with him yes. to another meal. And the other him. thing is, and Jesus. But said I want you to see something. This this group of believers that was divided was sinning. Yes. When Peter did, or the apostles did not respond as they were instructed, instructed by Jesus to do so. Jesus to do that sin became theirs. Right. They I, I, want you, I want you to... Accountable you, for it. Yeah, now I'm not going to sit here and tell you what you should do in that case. But I'm telling you that if you see your brother sin, Jesus said, you need to go to him and go to him alone. Mm. You need to act upon it. When you see sin in the, in the life of a brother or sister, you know, let the, be prayerful and seek God <laughs> about how you should respond. But I promise you, that if you have had the opportunity to see sin in their lives, God is giving you that opportunity for a reason, even if it's just to pray for them. Mm -hmm. Okay? Well, like I said, this uh, program should be about eight hours long and before, eight hours long if it was for me, but, but it's not. So I just want to take this time. We're going to come back because the next move on the part of the apostles, they tell the congregation, Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, who we may put in charge of this task. So that's their response to this problem, and we're going to look at that close. Now again, the reason I'm looking at this, the reason I'm asking you to look about, at this and pray about it, is because this is a, a course change in the history of the early church. All right? It's important because... The only way you can fix a course change, I can use the word repentance, is by making a course correction. Okay. So, Father, we just thank you for your word. We do, Jesus. Your word, Lord God, because we recognize, Lord, that we need each other, that, that I don't have it all, that Mark doesn't have it all, that Alice doesn't have it all, that you don't have it all. But this is why God gives us this fellowship in the word, that together we might work out our salvation in fear and trembling. Thank Hallelujah. You, Thank you, Lord. So until next week, don't forget, go to Facebook.com in search of Christianity and let us know. Give us your thoughts, your comments, your questions so you can participate in this. Make it a conversation, my brother. Make it a conversation, my sister. Until then, may God bless you abundantly and use you for the glory of His name. Hallelujah. God bless you till next time. Stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. But I love that old cross where the dearest and best are a world of lost sinners.